Okay, well, what I was alluding to before someone who walked in is what happens when there are orders of protection or some type of legal action against a man who's battering his partner or wife. I'm sorry? Typically what will happen from what we've seen, and again, I'm working primarily with the veteran population, but I believe that they are just a microcosm of the male population in general to most um, degrees, but I'll talk a little bit about what's different with veterans later. But what will happen is they won't leave marks on their victim, okay? They will start psychologically abusing. And what I've typically heard from the women is, well, he doesn't hit me anymore, he doesn't pull my hair, he doesn't push me and shove me, but he's really becoming more controlling with how I spend my time, where I go, what I do. And in addition to that, he's starting to play mind games. Now, I had talked about the gaslight effect, which is that term is used in research and literature about domestic violence. And it comes from the movie Gaslight. And if you ever have the chance, rent that movie in the classic section and watch it. It is the best video depiction of psychological beliefs that you'll ever see. Okay. The man who is the perpetrator in the film completely takes power and control over his wife, has her trusting her own judgment, believing she's crazy, and he has her right in the palm of his hand without ever laying a hand on her, without using any physical violence or threats of physical violence. And I always show that movie to my students and to my women in the groups. Because typically a woman will come in and say, he's not abusing me. And I say, well, what does he do? Well, he doesn't hit me. He doesn't push me. He's never thrown me down the stairs. He doesn't grab me. Um, well, what does he do? Well, he calls me stupid. He tells me I'm fat. He said nobody else would ever want me, so I'd better stay with him. You know, he'll say demeaning things to me. He'll try to confuse me. That's where the gaslight effect comes in. Okay. I had a case where a woman, uh, he'd call her on the cell phone and say, oh, I ran out of gas. You have to come and meet me. And he'd give her the wrong directions. Mm -hmm. So she'd get to where he told her to come, and he wasn't there. So she'd call him again, and he'd say, oh, that's not where I told you to come. I told you to go someplace else. So by the time she really got to where he was, he was there with two other men making a joke out of her display of emotion and he, he would say, look at this, you know, this hysterical crazy woman I have to live with. Why was she hysterical? Because he was trying to drive her crazy. He was giving her the wrong directions, making her think that he was in crisis so that she would respond. These are the kinds of things perpetrators do, okay? And that psychological abuse in addition to verbal abuse of demeaning the person, swearing at the person, undermining them, controlling them. Um, I've had a lot of cases where the woman wants to move on with her life and better herself, enroll in a college course. He'll destroy her textbooks. He'll do everything he can to prevent her from going to classes. To say, I won't babysit the kids. Or he'll call the babysitter and tell her not to come. Then he'll call her in class and say, the babysitter's gone, you better come home. So anything that the perpetrator can do to take power and control over the victim and keep her down. Okay. That's what it's all about. Psychological abuse is just as devastating as physical abuse. Okay. And don't think it can't kill you because it can. Okay. I can tell you that in the past year I had three women attempt suicide because of psychological abuse from their partner, not physical abuse. And in the one case, the woman had been physically abused. She reported it, and his punishment for, report, for reporting it was to say, I'm going to divorce you and then you'll be deported. So this was an interesting case where we had to have the International Institute immigration attorneys and everything involved. So her, that was her uh, consequences for reporting the physical abuse. So she stayed with him because he said he changed, but he started psychologically. And she wasn't driven to the point of suicide by the physical abuse. She was driven to the point of suicide by the psychological abuse. So just because the perpetrator doesn't lay hands on the victim, don't think for a minute that they're not being abused. Because I have talked to countless victims, and um, from my own history, I can say that this is true. Okay, Years later, you won't remember what the black eye or the broken arm felt like. But those old tapes are still up here. 
So on a day when you're not feeling good or you had a bad day at work or you're just really tired, you know, when you're vulnerable, that's why it's real important to take care of yourself, those old tapes will start playing, you know. And no, you're not hallucinating. Those are old tapes. You know, I told you you wouldn't succeed. You're a mess. You can't measure up, you know. Those thoughts are still out there. <coughs> and with treatment, we try to help women override those negative messages by creating positive new messages. Now, I know nobody uses tape recorders anymore, so I'm dating myself. Okay. <laughs> but we used to say, I've been doing this work a long time, so it used to be more relevant than it is now. We used to say that if you have a tape recorder and you have some music on there and you're sick of that music, you want to change the music? How can you do it? You record some new music over the top of it, okay? That's the same concept, okay? How do you get those negative messages out of your head? By getting new positive messages in your head. And how do you do that if the only contact you have is with the abuser? And that's exactly why <coughs> abusers isolate their victims. Tell them who they can be with, how long they can stay. Try and tell them they don't want them around their family or their friends. The isolation and control is a big piece of how they gain psychological empowerment over their victim. And I use the analogy with my students that it's like being a prisoner of war. I heard a wonderful psychologist some years ago, and she was a survivor of the Auschwitz death camps. She was the only member of her family to survive. And she ended up in her career later on doing domestic violence work because she said she finally gained an understanding of why women stay with their victims. Because the average person doesn't have a whole lot of sympathy that say, well, you must like it if you keep going back to them. Why do you stay? You know? Just leave. It's not that simple. So think about what happens with POWs. What do they do? Um, they isolate them. Okay. They may starve them, they may torture them, okay? Keep them in dark, dank places so that they're more vulnerable to illness, okay? And they hammer misinformation at them, okay? And after a while, because of the lack of stimulus and all the negative stimulus that is provided, they break down and this information that you're being fed starts becoming your reality. So, that's what has, and I have talked to numerous prisoners of war, and they say, yeah, that's exactly what happens, you know. You lose your ability to fight back over time. Yeah. Your self-esteem, your logical thinking, your physical and mental health become eroded by the environment of the abuse, and eventually you start believing what they're telling you, okay? What also happens is, I think about, you know, the concept of evolution. Species survive by adjusting to their environment, right? That's a battered women do too, okay? How do you survive? You adjust to your environment. You learn what to do to try not to piss them off, okay? You learn that when he gets this certain look in his eye, that's when you grab the kids and go to the neighbor. So women are very adept at knowing how to live within the abusive situation. They're just not quite as adept at knowing how to get away from it, okay? Because they haven't had that experience. And it's not that easy sometimes to seek services. And sometimes I work with countless people that they say the system fails them. If, if we don't help them make those connections and they feel that the system fails them, they're going to go right back to the situation. I can give you a story from my history. Okay. 1979, I was in Haven. Okay. It was a safe place, okay? But it didn't feel safe to me because it was strange. And I didn't have my stuff around. And you know what I missed? This is silly, but it's true. I missed my kitchen. I missed my kitchen. I didn't miss him, but I missed my kitchen, OK? And a women will understand what I'm saying. You know, you're in an unfamiliar environment. And yes, there are people there to talk to, but you're not sure they really understand. And I'd lay in bed at night, and I had this feeling like my throat was closing up. And I went to the doctor, and the doctor examined me, and I was much younger at the time, obviously, and he said, there's nothing wrong with you, you need a psychiatrist, okay? Which is why I train the providers at the VA, that you don't say things like that. Because what did that make me think? It made me think I'm crazy. 